Section number six of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kira Davidson. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section six. The Chimera. Part One. Once, in the old, old times, for all the strange things which I tell you about happened long before anybody can remember, a fountain gushed out of a hillside in the marvellous land of Greece. And, for aught I know, after so many thousand years, it is still gushing out of the very self-same spot. At any rate, there was the pleasant fountain welling freshly forth and sparkling adown the hillside in the golden sunset, when a handsome young man named Bellerophon drew near its margin. In his hand he held a bridle, studded with brilliant gems, and adorned with a golden bit. Seeing an old man, and another of middle age, and a little boy near the fountain, and likewise a maiden, who was dipping up some of the water in a pitcher, he paused, and begged that he might refresh himself with a draught. "'This is very delicious water,' he said to the maiden, as he rinsed and filled her pitcher, after drinking out of it. "'Will you be kind enough to tell me whether the fountain has any name?' "'Yes, it is called the Fountain of Pyrene,' answered the maiden, and then she added, "'My grandmother has told me that this clear fountain was once a beautiful woman.' and when her son was killed by the arrows of the huntress Diana, she melted all away into tears. And so the water, which you find so cool and sweet, is the sorrow of that poor mother's heart. I should not have dreamed, observed the young stranger, that so clear a wellspring, with its gush and gurgle, and its cheery dance out of the shade into the sunlight, had so much as one teardrop in its bosom. And this, then, is Pyrene? I thank you, pretty maiden, for telling me its name. I have come from a faraway country to find this very spot. A middle-aged country fellow, he had driven his cow to drink out of the spring, stared hard at young Bellerophon and at the handsome bridle which he carried in his hand. The watercourses must be getting low, friend, in your part of the world, remarked he, if you come so far only to find the fountain of Pyrene. But pray, have you lost a horse? I see you carry the bridle in your hand, and a very pretty one it is, with that double row of bright stones upon it. If the horse was as fine as the bridle, you are much to be pitied for losing him. I have lost no horse, said Bellerophon with a smile but I happen to be seeking a very famous one, which, as wise people have informed me, must be found hereabouts, if anywhere. Do you know whether the winged horse Pegasus still haunts the fountain of Pyrene, as he used to do in your forefathers' days? But the country fellow laughed. Some of you, my little friends, have probably heard that this Pegasus was a snow-white steed with beautiful silvery wings, who spent most of his time on the summit of Mount Helicon. He was as wild and as swift and as buoyant in his flight through the air as any eagle that ever soared into the clouds. There was nothing else like him in the world. He had no mate. He never had been backed or bridled by a master, and, for many a long year, he led a solitary and happy life. Oh, how fine a thing it is to be a winged horse! Sleeping at night, as he did, on a lofty mountain top, and passing the greater part of the day in the air, Pegasus seemed hardly to be a creature of the earth. Whenever he was seen, up very high above people's heads, with the sunshine on his silvery wings, you would have thought that he belonged to the sky, and that, Skimming a little too low, he had got astray among our mists and vapours, and was seeking his way back again. 
It was very pretty to behold him plunge into the fleecy bosom of a bright cloud and be lost in it for a moment or two, and then break forth from the other side, or in a sullen rainstorm, when there was a grey pavement of clouds over the whole sky. It would sometimes happen that the winged horse descended right through it, and the glad light of the upper region would gleam after him. In another instant, it is true, both Pegasus and the pleasant light would be gone away together. But any one that was fortunate enough to see this wondrous spectacle felt cheerful the whole day afterwards, and as much longer as the storm lasted. In the summer-time, and in the beautifulest of weather, Pegasus often alighted on the solid earth, and, closing his silvery wings, would gallop over hill and dale for pastime, as fleetly as the wind. Oftener than in any other place, he had been seen near the fountain of Pyrene, drinking the delicious water, or rolling himself upon the soft grass of the margin. Sometimes, too, but Pegasus was very dainty in his food. He would crop a few of the clover blossoms that happened to be sweetest. To the fountain of Pyrene, therefore, people's great-grandfathers had been in the habit of going as long as they were youthful and retained their faith in winged horses, in hopes of getting a glimpse at the beautiful Pegasus. But, of late years, he had been very seldom seen. Indeed, there were many of the country folks, dwelling within half an hour's walk of the fountain, who had never beheld Pegasus, and did not believe that there was any such creature in existence. The country fellow to whom Bellerophon was speaking chanced to be one of those incredulous persons, and that was the reason why he laughed. Pegasus, indeed, cried he, turning up his nose as high as such a flat nose could be turned up. Pegasus, indeed, a winged horse, truly. Why, friend, are you in your senses? Of what use would wings be to a horse? Could he drag the plough so well, think you? To be sure, there might be a little saving in the expense of shoes, but then how would a man like to see his horse flying out of the stable window? Yes, or whisking him up above the clouds when he only wanted to ride to mill? No, no, I don't believe in Pegasus. There never was such a ridiculous kind of horse fowl made. I have some reason to think otherwise, said Bellerophon quietly. And then he turned to an old grey man, who was leaning on a staff, and listening very attentively, with his head stretched forward and one hand at his ear, because, for the last twenty years, he had been getting rather deaf. And what say you, venerable sir? inquired he. In your younger days, I should imagine, you must frequently have seen the winged steed. Ah, young stranger, my memory is very poor, said the aged man. When I was a lad, if I remember rightly, I used to believe that there was such a horse, and so did everybody else. But nowadays I hardly know what to think, and very seldom think about the winged horse at all, if I ever saw the creature. It was a long, long while ago, and, to tell you the truth, I doubt whether I ever did see him. One day, to be sure, when I was quite a youth, I remember seeing some hoof-tramps round about the brink of the fountain. Pegasus might have made those hoof-marks, and so might some other horse. And have you never seen him, my fair maiden? asked Bellerophon of the girl, who stood with the pitcher on her head while this talk went on. You certainly could see Pegasus, if anybody can, for your eyes are very bright. Once I thought I saw him, replied the maiden with a smile and a blush. It was either Pegasus or a large white bird, a very great way up in the air. And one other time, as I was coming to the fountain with my pitcher, I heard a neigh. Oh, such a brisk and melodious neigh as that was! 
my very heart leaped with delight at the sound. But it startled me, nevertheless, so I ran home without filling my pitcher. That truly was a pity, said Bellerophon. And he turned to the child, whom I mentioned at the beginning of the story, and who was gazing at him, as children are apt to gaze at strangers, with his rosy mouth wide open. Well, my little fellow, cried Bellerophon, playfully pulling one of his curls, I suppose you have often seen the winged horse. That I have, answered the child very readily. I saw him yesterday, as many times before. You are a fine little man, said Bellerophon, drawing the child closer to him. Come, tell me all about it. Why, replied the child, I often come here to sail little boats in the fountain, and to gather pretty pebbles out of its basin. And sometimes, when I look down into the water, I see the image of the winged horse in the picture of the sky that is there. I wish he would come down and take me on his back and let me ride him up to the moon. But if I so much as stir to look at him, he flies far away out of sight. And Bellerophon put his faith in the child, who had seen the image of Pegasus on the water, and in the maiden, who had heard him neigh so melodiously, rather than in the middle-aged clown, who believed only in cart-horses, or in the old man who had forgotten the beautiful things of his youth. Therefore, he haunted about the fountain of Pyrene for a great many days afterward, he kept continually on the watch, looking upward at the sky or else down into the water, hoping forever that he should see either the reflected image of the winged horse or the marvellous reality. He held the bridle, with its bright gems and golden bit, always ready in his hand. The rustic people who dwelt in the neighbourhood and drove their cattle to the fountain to drink would often laugh at poor Bellerophon, and sometimes take him pretty severely to task. They told him that an able-bodied young man like himself ought to have better business than to be wasting his time in such idle pursuit. They offered to sell him a horse if he wanted one, and when Bellerophon declined the purchase, they tried to drive a bargain with him for his fine bridle. Even the country boys thought him so very foolish that they used to have a great deal of sport about him, and were rude enough not to care a fig, although Bellerophon saw and heard it. One little urchin, for example, would play Pegasus, and cut the oddest imaginable capers by way of flying, while one of his schoolfellows would scamper after him, holding forth a twist of bulrushes, which was intended to represent Bellerophon's ornamental bridle. But the gentle child, who had seen the picture of Pegasus in the water, comforted the young stranger more than all the naughty boys could torment him. The dear little fellow, in his play hours, often sat down beside him, and, without speaking a word, would look down into the fountain and up toward the sky, with so innocent a faith that Bellerophon could not help feeling encouraged. Now, you will, perhaps, wish to be told why it was that Bellerophon had undertaken to catch a winged horse, and we shall find no better opportunity to speak about this matter than while he is waiting for Pegasus to appear. If I were to relate the whole of Bellerophon's previous adventures, they might easily grow into a very long story. It will be quite enough to say that, in a certain country of Asia, a terrible monster called a chimera had made its appearance, and was doing more mischief than could be talked about between now and sunset. According to the best accounts which I have been able to obtain, this chimera was nearly, if not quite, the ugliest and most poisonous creature, and the strangest and unaccountablest and the hardest to fight with, and the most difficult to run away from, that ever came out of the earth's inside. It had a tail like a boa constrictor. Its body was like I do not care what, 
and it had three separate heads, one of which was a lion's, the second a goat's, and the third an abominably great snake's. And a hot blast of fire came flaming out of each of its three mouths. Being an earthly monster, I doubt whether it had any wings, but wings or no, it ran like a goat and a lion, and wriggled along like a serpent, and thus contrived to make about as much speed as all the three together. Oh, the mischief, and mischief, and mischief, that this naughty creature did! With its flaming breath, it could set a forest on fire, or burn up a field of grain, or, for that matter, a village, with all its fences and houses. It laid waste to the whole country around, and used to eat up people and animals alive, and cook them afterward in the burning oven of its stomach. Mercy on us, little children! I hope neither you nor I will ever happen to meet a chimera. While the hateful beast, if a beast we can anywise call it, was doing all these horrible things, it so chanced that Bellerophon came to that part of the world on a visit to the king. The king's name was Iobates, and Lycia was the country which he ruled over. Bellerophon was one of the bravest youths in the world, and desired nothing so much as to do some valiant and beneficent deed, such as would make all mankind admire and love him. In those days, the only ways for a young man to distinguish himself was by fighting battles, either with the enemies of his country, or with wicked giants, or with troublesome dragons, or with wild beasts, when he could find nothing more dangerous to encounter. King Iobates, perceiving the courage of his youthful visitor, proposed to him to go and fight the chimera, which everybody else was afraid of, and which, unless it should be soon killed, was likely to convert Lycia into a desert. Bellerophon hesitated not a moment, but assured the king that he would either slay this dreaded chimera, or perish in the attempt. But, in the first place, as the monster was so prodigiously swift, he bethought himself that he should never win the victory by fighting on foot. The wisest thing he could do, therefore, was to get the very best and fleetest horse that could anywhere be found. And what other horse in all the world was half so fleet as the marvellous horse Pegasus, who had wings as well as legs, and was even more active in the air than on the earth? To be sure, a great many people denied that there was any such horse with wings, and said that the stories about him were all poetry and nonsense. But, wonderful as it appeared, Bellerophon believed that Pegasus was a real steed, and hoped that he himself might be fortunate enough to find him, and, once fairly mounted on his back, he would be able to fight the Chimera at better advantage. And this was the purpose with which he had travelled from Lycia to Greece, and had put the beautifully ornamented bridle in his hand. It was an enchanted bridle. If he could only succeed in putting the golden bit in the mouth of Pegasus, the winged horse would be submissive, and would own Bellerophon for his master, and fly whithersoever as he might choose to turn the rein. But, indeed, it was a weary and anxious time, while Bellerophon waited and waited for Pegasus, in hopes that he would come and drink at the fountain of Pyrene. He was afraid lest King Iobates should imagine that he had fled from the Chimera. It pained him, too, to think of how much mischief the monster was doing, while he himself, instead of fighting with it, was compelled to sit idly poring over the bright waters of Pyrene as they gushed out of the sparkling sand. And as Pegasus came thither so seldom in these latter years, and scarcely alighted there more than once in a lifetime, Bellerophon feared that he might grow an old man, and have no strength left in his arms, nor courage in his heart, before the winged horse would appear 
Oh, how heavily passes the time, while an adventurous youth is yearning to do his part in life, and to gather in the harvest of his renown. How hard a lesson it is to wait! Our life is brief, and how much of it is spent in teaching us only this. Well was it for Bellerophon that the gentle child had grown so fond of him, and was never weary of keeping him company. Every morning the child gave him a new hope to put in his bosom, instead of yesterday's withered one. Dear Bellerophon, he would cry, looking up hopefully into his face, I think we shall see Pegasus today. And, at length, if it had not been for the little boy's unwavering faith, Bellerophon would have given up all hope, and would have gone back to Lycia, and have done his best to slay the Chimera without the help of the winged horse. And in that case, poor Bellerophon would at least have been terribly scorched by the creature's breath, and would most probably have been killed and devoured. Nobody should ever try to fight an earth-born chimera unless he can first get upon the back of an aerial steed. End of section 6